Here at L4 Media, we talk high school football, 4A, 3A, and 2A in Texas. We talk East Texas sports. We talk NFL, guy talk, movie, and booze. We also talk wrestling and so much more. So like and subscribe and check us out. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the inaugural episode of the Texas Two Seam Podcast, part of Outdrank the Coverage on L4 Media. My name is Ryan Fox. Happy to be with you guys today. Thank you for tuning in to the first ever episode of the Texas Two Seam Podcast, a weekly podcast where we will uh, discuss the in and outs and the headlines of Major League Baseball with an emphasis on the defending World Series champion Texas Rangers. My name is Ryan Fox. Once again, great to be with you here for the first episode of the Texas Two Seam Podcast. I want to give a Quick shout out to our first official sponsor of the podcast, and that is Car Motor Company. Car Motor Company is a classic and late model uh, car dealership uh, located in historic downtown Cleburne. Their address at 302 South Caddo in downtown Cleburne. Uh, where they have everything you're looking for, where, whether it's classic or late model cars, trucks, uh, sedans, convertibles, SUVs, you name it, they got it with an uh, ever-changing inventory, changing weekly, uh, something you can keep up with with that inventory at www.txcar.com. That's www.txkar.com, or you can give them a call at 817-666-1111. Again, that's Car Motor Company in downtown Cleburne. I want to thank them for their sponsorship of the Texas Two Seam uh, Podcast. Uh, great show that we have lined up for you today. We'll discuss the headlines and the fallout of opening weekend for the 2024 Major League Baseball season. Uh, I guess, again, including uh, the defending World Series champion Texas Rangers as they took two of three in a three-game uh, opening home series against the Chicago Cubs. They took games one and two. Uh, and then fell in the uh, series finale on Sunday afternoon uh, by a score of nine to five. We'll dive deeper into that series uh, later on, as well as some answer some questions regarding the uh, Rangers uh, competition in the American League Western Division and the brighter um, or the broader rather uh, American League uh, future playoff picture as well. We'll dive into that as well as cover more events from a very eventful opening weekend across Major League Baseball that saw three bench-clearing incidents, uh, one of which that we will talk about uh, later on the show, the uh, late slide incident uh, between Reese Hoskins of the Milwaukee Brewers and Jeff McNeil of the New York Mets. We'll dive into that one later on as well, as well uh, as touching on some of the rule changes that are being implemented into Major League Baseball heading into this 2024 season. These changes, uh, a little bit more subtle uh, com- when you compare them to the extreme rule changes that we saw heading into last season uh, in MLB. We'll dive into some of those rule changes uh, later on in the show as well. And our first ever guest right here on the Texas Two Seam Podcast will be none other than Jared Sandler. Jared Sandler is uh, one of the Rangers broadcasters on the Texas Rangers radio network, as well as a uh, regular on 105 through the fan where he hosts the uh, post game Rangers extra inning show on 105 through the fan. He also has the straight up Texas podcast uh, that he hosts throughout the season as well. And a, and a, leader of the Sandlot Children's Charity, which we'll talk with Jared about uh, later on in the show as well. And we'll talk to Jared Sandler about a lot of Rangers topics, including the quick rise of Wyatt Langford and probably some of the questions of the relief pitching uh, committee rotation for the Rangers, more particularly in that closing spot. Uh, Some questions might have been raised, uh, especially uh, when you look at Jose LeClerc, who had a phenomenal a year, particularly in the postseason for the Texas Rangers last year during their World Series championship run. Uh, But uh, not the greatest uh, opening two uh, appearances in the 2024 season for Jose LeClerc, particularly 
on Sunday afternoon, but we'll dive into that later as well, as well as get to some of you, some of your fan questions. Uh, we are partner, partnering up as well with the Texas Rangers fans only Facebook page. Uh, and in that Facebook page, it's one of the fastest growing uh, Ranger fan groups across the internet. It's on Facebook. And uh, at the time of recording this, they are just under seven thousand followers and they started the page up in november so again one of the quickest growing ranger fan groups across the internet not just on facebook but everywhere Uh, and we'll be partnering with them across the season we'll be posting uh, all of our episodes there as well as our weekly questions well we plan on recording these episodes uh, on sundays towards the end of the baseball weekend to where you can recap the the previous week and head into next week. Uh, That'll be the layout for every episode uh, for the Texas two scene podcast across the year. And on this Texas Rangers fan only page, uh, we will post a thread where you can ask weekly questions uh, for myself and the guests that we will have uh, regularly on the show, including Jared Sandler, which we'll have today. We have some of the questions uh, from the first question thread that we posted on the Texas Rangers fans only Facebook page that myself and Jared will answer later on today's show. Again, great community, Aaron and Tracy, they do a fantastic job uh, running the page for Texas Rangers fans only. Uh, So be sure to join that group, man. Uh, Just if you are a true blue Rangers fan, it's the best page on Facebook and the internet uh, for you to just interact with fans. They have live uh, in-game chats and post-game chats as well, where you can post your thoughts and interact with fellow Ranger fans as well. So join the group, man. It's a fun deal. We'll be interacting with them as well, and it'll give you a chance to interact with myself and our weekly guests right here on the Texas Two Seam Podcast. We'll step aside for a quick break, and when we come back, we will start with the opening headlines and the fallout uh, from the 2024 opening weekend of Major League Baseball as well. Again, later on, we will have our interview with Jared Sandler and answer some of your fan questions of, as well. But let's head into our break, and we'll be back with you in just a moment right here on the Texas Two Scene Podcast, part of Outdrink the Coverage on L4 Media. Car Motor Company is your destination for classic and late model vehicles in North Central Texas, located at 302 South Caddo in downtown Cleburne. They have everything you're looking for from classic cars and trucks to late model cars and trucks, convertibles, and SUVs. If you'd like to call ahead of your visit, they can be reached at 817-666-1111. With inventory changing weekly, there's a little bit of everything at Car Motor Company. Be sure to visit the website www.txcar.com. That's www.txkar.com to keep up with their ever-changing inventory. They're open from 9 to 5.30 on Tuesday through Friday and at 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock on Saturdays, closed Sunday and Monday. And also, if you mention this advertisement and Texas 2 Seam during your next visit to Car Motor Company, they'll give you $200 off any vehicle purchase. Stop by Car Motor Company while you shop and eat in historic downtown Cleburne. Again, you can give them a call at 817-666-1111 or visit their website at www.txcar.com. That's www.txkar.com. And welcome back to Texas Two Seam, right here, part of Outdrink the Coverage on L4 Media. My name is Ryan Fox. I want to give a quick shout out to you guys. Thank you for listening. Uh, to the inaugural episode of Texas Two Seam, whether you're listening to us uh, via audio on your favorite podcast platform or viewing us on the L4 Media Company YouTube channel, thank you for tuning in to the inaugural episode of Texas Two Seam. As we mentioned at the top of the show, uh, very loaded, a lot of topics to get into today, uh, starting with the fallout of all the headlines from opening weekend across Major League Baseball. Let's start over in Los Angeles as the Dodgers take three of four from the Cardinals, uh, You know, despite being kind of overshadowed uh, by the Shohei Otani uh, sports gambling 
uh, controversy involving him and his now former translator, uh, uh, Mr. Mizuhara. Uh, they were, you know, conv- or accused of four and a half million dollars uh, being used for sports gambling. Which, of course, if you are a player, um, a professional player, that's kind of a big no-no. I mean, it's kind of sports gambling has been such a controversial topic for a very long time now, especially in baseball. And now, but with sports gambling, it's becoming very mainstream. It's become mainstream really in the last five to 10 years. I mean, there's a lot of online sports books out there, apps that you can, you know, access and really bet on anything, you know, from UFC, Major League Baseball, NBA, NFL, any sport you can think of, there's an online sports book where you can probably bet on it. So it's really become more mainstream. But it's a controversial topic when it, re- in regards to players uh, placing, you know, sports bets, especially when they're using, you know, four and a half million dollars to do so, allegedly. Uh, so, but despite all that, the Dodgers taking care of business at home, uh, taking three or four uh, from the Cardinals. And again, that the Dodgers lineup, man, it is ferocious. It is stacked. You got you got Shohei Otani, Freddie Freeman, uh, Mookie Betts. You know, just to name a few, uh, a lot of heavy hitters out there uh, in Los Angeles for the Dodgers, and they got to be an early favorite uh, for the National League uh, championship bid uh, over there uh, in the National League for Major League Baseball. So keep an eye on that as well, and we'll keep an eye on the uh, sports gambling controversy uh, regarding Shohei Otani and his uh, former uh, translator as that story transpires as well. <clears throat> we also mentioned at the top of the show that we wanted to talk a little bit about the rule changes uh, that are being implemented in Major League Baseball uh, here in 2024. Uh, just, a, just a couple of the ones that kind of stuck out to me uh, with the wider base paths. Uh, now the base path ha- has been extended from the foul line into the grass as well, and that's going to be really beneficial uh, for right-handed batters as they try to run out of the box, they won't have to take such a wide turn out of the right-handed batter's box. So it'll give them a more direct path to first base. So if they hit a you know, infield grounder, it gives them a better chance to leg it out and beat the throw. And for pitch clocks, uh, the time has been reduced. Uh, it's still 15 seconds for if there's no runners on base. Uh, but when, or when there's not any runners on base, but when there is runners on base, the pitch clock was at 20 seconds, and now it has been reduced to 18 seconds with runners on base. And you got, you know, some may think, you know, two seconds, what is that? And it wouldn't, the way I look at it, you know, there's 30 teams, they're all going to play 162 games, and that's total of 2,430 games that are going to be played in Major League Baseball this season, uh, not counting the playoffs. So over 2,400 games. So, at two seconds getting taken off of uh, the pitch clock with runners on. With over 2,400 games, you got to think that'll add up. And it's just a really big part of Major League Baseball's goal to just make the games go by quicker. And another step or another provision they're making in order to try to achieve that goal is also with the mound visits. Mound visits have been, now been reduced. They were to five mound visits uh, per game for each team, but it has now been reduced to four. Uh, but and, and a little tweak as well, if a team has zero mound visits uh, at the end of the eighth, so going into the ninth inning, if they have zero, they are awarded uh, one extra one should they choose to use it uh, in the ninth inning. And I think that um, that happens in extra innings as well where they still get uh, one mound visit uh, per inning. And again, they're just putting a really strong emphasis I'm trying to shorten these games. Uh, a lot of the, you know, we talked about it before, a lot of the extreme rule changes that were implemented prior to last season, including probably the biggest one, the game clock, led to a huge reduction. Game game times overall, on average, in Major League Baseball last year were a half hour shorter on average. I think it was like 31 to 32 minutes shorter on average last year, and that's a significant decrease in time when you consider how long the games used to drag out, 
having a pitch clock, you know, it reduced the time really greatly. And for someone like me, I, I don't mind that. I don't mind that at all. I mean, there's probably a lot of old school people out there that are like, you know, don't mess with the game or whatever, but I think it's a good thing for baseball. And the other rule changes last year were, you know, uh, the bases uh, being bigger as well, just, and the removing of the shift um, on top of that. And so it just, I think it made baseball more exciting to watch last year. And I think that's going to carry over as, you know, the players start to get used to these rule changes. And I think these little tweaks uh, that they're adding in 2024 uh, will help that as well. And again, it's like that old ad, it says the only thing constant is change. And that, that applies get to the major league baseball just as much as anything else. So I think they're going to continue to add tweaks as the years go on and kind of, you know, tweak the current rules that they've are extreme changes that they've already implemented and add tweaks to them as well to where eventually the games could be running from an hour and a half to two hours. Uh, we'll have to see, but right now they're doing still adding any tweaks they can to, you know, shorten the length of uh, Major League Baseball games here. So we'll keep an eye on that one as well. Just a couple more subtle rule changes that are being made to Major League Baseball uh, this year. And uh, <laughs> one of the big stories uh, that came out of Major League Baseball uh, over opening weekend was a controversial late slide that a that resulted in a benches clearing affair uh, between the Brewers and and the Mets over the weekend. It involved a um, Brewers player, Reese Hawkins, Reese Hoskins, a uh, former Philadelphia Philly, with a late slide on the second baseman for the uh, New York Mets, uh, Jeff McNeil. Let's go ahead and take a look at the footage and just kind of talk about it as well. Down to third, a chance for two. So you see here it's hit to third and then that late slide to Hoskins into McNeil and they called him out at second and then McNeil was very heated as you can see here. And we got some hard feelings as Hoskins. The replay will come up here in just a second, but it was, you know, it, it appears, although with the rule book as well, technically this is a legal slide, although the Major League Baseball attempted, or they want to try to eradicate kind of late slides like that just because of the injury implications that could happen with the late, late slide like that. And that's why McNeil was really upset about this it was a late slide and his inward knee kind of buckled there a little bit you can see, you can see him right there he was not happy um and, and i can't blame him you know and when i look at this footage oh, and barking. reese hoskins giving him oh, the, <laughs> the crimea river i mean you could take you can take the player out of philly but you can't take the philly out of the player reese hoskins man but when i look at this footage and the replay will be coming up soon do I think Reese Hoskins was trying to intentionally hurt Jeff McNeil? No, I don't. I think it was just a little bit of a late slide, which, again, Major League Baseball is trying to get rid of as well. Um, but I think Hoskins was just trying to do exactly what he accomplished. I think he was just trying to break up the play to prevent the inning-ending double play right here. You know, he started the slide right before he got to the base. I mean, but you could see Jeff McNeil's knee kind of buckled inside there and you can understand the frustration um but again i don't think reese hoskins was trying to hurt him i think he was just trying to break up the double play which he did but it's it's just kind of a tough deal you know but i can understand both sides here hoskins just trying to break up the play and then mcneil being upset uh, about the late the late slide but it's just it's just one of the it's just one of those things man it's it's, it's kind of tough. And they reviewed it as well, and it ended up being a, a, a clean slide in there in second base for Reese Hoskins. Excuse me, but, you know, it was just one of the few bases clearing incidents uh, in Major League Baseball in opening weekend. 
And I, I can understand why. I can understand both sides. The late slide just trying to break, break up the double play, and I can understand the frustration of Jeff McNeil. I mean, this this does appear to be one of those slides that they're just trying to – that Major League Baseball is trying to prevent from happening. So, again, I can understand both sides. But that's one of the uh, big events that happened across Major League Baseball uh, this opening weekend, the late slide uh, with – Reese Hoskins of the Brewers and Jeff McNeil of the New York Mets. Just kind of a, again, you can kind of see it from both sides. Um, again, I don't, I don't think Reese Hoskins was intentionally trying to hurt Jeff McNeil, but you know, stuff happens and it, it could have been a freak accident if he, you know, if he came in just a, you know, a little bit faster and just caught, you know, McNeil's knee in the wrong spot. That could have been a devastating injury. But good good thing no one was hurt. But I can again I can understand both sides. And then now let's go ahead and talk about the defending World Series champion Texas Rangers. As again, uh, they opened their series at home, a three-game series with the Chicago Cubs, uh, starting their title defense there. They took two of three. They won opening night off a very um, solid performance. Uh, from the Rangers' ace, Nathan Avaldi, He pitched six innings, uh, giving up two runs, both earned on four hits, and only walked one batter while striking out three. So a solid performance uh, to start the season uh, for the Rangers' ace, uh, Nathan Avaldi. Kind of a back-and-forth affair between the Rangers and the Cubs in Game 1, uh, which was Thursday night, opening night for Major League Baseball at Globe Life Field. It was nationally broadcast on ESPN, it was a great game. Uh, again, the Rangers won uh, 4-3, but not without some controversy on the um, umpire side. Imagine that. Uh, so in the top of the ninth, uh, the bases were loaded for the Cubs, and the game was tied 2-2, uh, and a, a pass ball that was really a foul ball that wasn't called got by Jonah Heim, and he kind of slow played it, thinking that it was called a foul ball. And when the runner at third base realized that Chad Fairchild, the home plate umpire, was like, oh, no, that's just a pass ball, he took off for home and gave the Cubs the lead, uh, which shouldn't have happened. It should have been set back to third. Now, could the Cubs have scored eventually? You know, if that was called a foul ball, sure. But that's not how the game transpired. And that ended up giving the Cubs the lead in the top of the ninth. And then in the bottom of the ninth, how about Travis Jankowski, man? He did a great job in his fill-in utility role uh, for the Rangers during their 2023 campaign, especially in the World Series. He came in for uh, Dolis Garcia after he went down, uh, I think it was in Game 2 or Game 3 of the World Series uh, in Arizona. He took over in Game 3 in the right field and had a solid uh, performance for the Rangers. And then his first at-bat, uh, in the opening night game in Arlington, he hits a pinch hit solo home run. Only his 11th career home run, uh, and, which is crazy. He's been in the league for a long time. I, I can't remember when he made his major league debut. It was like, I think it was the early 2010s, uh, I think something like that. And he has 11 career home runs, and his 11th career home run was a game tying home run in the bottom of the ninth, which forced the game into extra innings. And then Jonah Heim, again, he was kind of beating himself up, just allowing – well, he didn't allow it, but that pass ball that just got by you know, Chad Fairchild missing that obvious foul ball, which is just unfortunate to see. You know, umpires, with things like that, they got to be held accountable. But Chad Fairchild, he's been one of those umpires that, you know, has sometimes been caught up in controversy with, like, you know, controversial calls, but a lot of umpires in Major League Baseball today, and it especially happens when your your crew chief is Ron Culpa, who you know, no explanation needed there. So that center of controversy himself and a lot of crazy calls that have gone wrong in the past in Major League Baseball. But then Jonah Heim coming up in the uh, bottom of the 10th with the bases loaded, uh, he had a chance for redemption, and he took full advantage of it. But now Heim has a chance at redemption. The infield moves back. And Ruffles into right center. He is going to get the redemption. Heim! 
Prime walks it off. The Rangers win the opener. <laughs> Baseball. Unbelievable. Awesome deal there for Jonah Heim. Getting the walk-off single. He smoked it into the alley in right center field to give the Rangers the 4-3 extra innings victory on opening night. And then in game two, it was pretty much all Rangers from the jump, a six spot for the Rangers uh, in the bottom of the eighth inning, helped cap off an 11-2 victory, which was that six running was capped off by uh, Josh Young with his first home run of the year, a two-run homer, which made it 11-2 in the eighth. And then the Rangers uh, finished the job in the top of the ninth to win game two uh, by a score of 11 to two. And then the uh, series finale, which is played Sunday afternoon at globe life field. Again, more, another back and forth affair. John Gray took the mound for the Rangers in game three. And it was, you know, not his best outing. Uh, he gave up, you know, five runs on seven hits. And then the, Oh, Overall, I think the relief pitching did just fine. Jose Urania made his uh, Rangers debut. He pitched two scoreless innings, very well done. Yerry Rodriguez, right after him, two scoreless innings. And then uh, Jose Leclerc coming in with a tie game in the top of the ninth. And then it just got away from the Rangers at that point. The, the real killer for the Rangers in uh, the series finale on Sunday afternoon was walks. Rangers pitching uh, across the entire game walked nine batters. And then offensively, they left nine runners on base, which is not a good combo uh, that will result in a win for you. But again, they do win the series, uh, take, taking two out of three at home against the Chicago Cubs. But the biggest question from that uh, loss on Sunday afternoon is, what's that closing role going to look like? You know, if, if Jose LeClerc you know, if this becomes a problem, the walks, you know, if it becomes a consistent problem, it might be one of those things where the Rangers are going to have to try to find that next solid closer, or it could be what happened for the majority of last season, could kind of be a closer by committee. You now you you had LeClerc in there, but he struggled a little bit, and then they had Will Smith, who's now with the Kansas City Royals, you know, and but they do have a lot of young arms. Again, mentioned Yerry Rodriguez, he did a great job. Uh, pitching two scoreless innings today, uh, Sunday uh, for the Rangers, even though they ended up losing the game. he's He himself still had a really good performance, uh, but that's something to keep an eye on, and that's something we'll talk about with Jared later on, Jared Sandler, Rangers broadcaster, later on in the show. What's that closing role going to look like for the Rangers going forward? I mean, I think right now for me, I think it is Jose Leclerc's to lose especially after the stellar performance he had during their World Series run last season. I really think it is his to lose. But, you know, if this, you know, walking three batters and, you know, giving opponents the lead in the ninth inning, <clears throat> excuse me, becomes a, you know, a consistent problem, then the Rangers are just going to have to eventually look in another direction. But that's something to keep an eye on as we go further into the season for the Rangers, again, don't want to overreact. We're only three games in. Um, they only, it's a long season. There's still 159 games left in the regular season for the Rangers. Uh, so we'll see how they handle that, uh, that closing role, as well as the overall pitching. Because you got to think as well, in the starting rotation, they still have Max Scherzer and Jacob deGrom still out for a while. DeGrom is not expected to be back until August, which could be good if he's able to come back and be healthy and be at his best form. That could be huge for the Rangers, especially if they're pushing for a playoff spot uh, there when August rolls around later in the season. But for Max Scherzer, he, I believe he's expected to come back uh, sooner than expected. I think he's eyeing a late May or early June return as well. But again, um, you never know for sure with Tommy John surgery as you know pertaining to Jacob DeGrom. So that'll be something we can talk about with Jared uh, later on in the show uh, as well whenever we have him uh, coming up next. Uh, but again, Rangers win their opening series. They take two of three at home, and now they're going to hit the road against the 
Tampa Bay Rays, the team that they swept in the wild card round uh, during their 2023 playoff run to the World Series, uh, they'll be playing them for the first time since that wild card series at Tropicana Field in St. Petersburg, Florida. Uh, and we'll preview that one uh, with Jared Sandler as well. But one more uh, d- quick discussion to talk about uh, before we get to Jared. Uh, in the AL West for the Rangers, again, don't want to overreact. It's the opening weekend, opening series at Houston dropping all four games at home to the New York Yankees. Um, it's The Astros, just for the moment, just can't seem to win at home. That was a problem for them all last season. Again, they got swept at home by the Rangers in the ALCS last year. It just seems like, as of late, they just can't win at home, and that's something they're going to have to address. Uh, it's their first year under their new manager, their bench coach that uh, – they, you know, promoted from within to become the new manager. And that's something they'll just have to address, you know, because you got to win at home, whether it's the regular season or the postseason, you have to win at home. And that's something that the Astros are struggling with. And so the question that poses is, is Seattle a bigger threat to the Rangers in the West than Houston is? Or could it be a three-way, you know, dogfight for the AL West title? I don't know. That's something we'll discuss with Sandler as well. I personally think just going the overreacting to opening weekend again, you know, Seattle, they split their four game series with the Boston Red Sox. Now the Red Sox, you know, over there in the AL East, I think they could be a sleeper team a a potential wild card team in the American league. I just don't know how they're going to keep up with the Yankees and the Orioles over them over there in the east though and hey, not even to mention the rays you know we'll have to see what they have coming back as well and i think that rangers series in tampa will be very telling of it'll be a good measuring stick game for both the rangers and the rays uh in this you know early part of the season but that's something to keep an eye on as well but is is seattle a bigger threat than houston you tell me leave it in the comments below and just tell me what you think Tell me what you think. I, I personally think, again, that Seattle is the bigger threat to the Rangers, at least for now in this early part of the season. But, again, that could change. 162-game season. We'll just have to see how it develops. But right now, for sure, I think Seattle is the biggest threat to the Rangers for the AL West title um, in 2024. But that's it. That's just some of the topics I wanted to cover at the top of the show. Coming up next, we will have – Rangers radio broadcaster Jared Sandler as the first ever guest on Texas Two Seam. Coming up next, right here on Texas Two Seam, part of Outdrink the Coverage on L4 Media. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Texas Two Seam podcast. My name is Ryan Fox, uh, Texas Two Seam, part of Outdrink the Coverage on L4 Media, and I am very happy to welcome our very first guest on the podcast, Mr. Jared Sandler, the uh, Rangers Radio Network broadcaster. You can find him on 105.3 The Fan, as well as the Straight Up Texas podcast and on Bally Sports Southwest. Jared, first off, man, thanks for coming. How are you doing today? Hey, Ron. Thanks so much for having me. I'm doing great. It's uh, great to have baseball back and excited that the season is underway and that the Rangers are off to a good start. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And let's talk about that good start. They took two of three in their opening opening home series against the Chicago Cubs. A lot of offense. It just seems like the offense hasn't uh, skipped a beat uh, in the offseason. In fact, it seems like they might have gotten better. Uh, But, um, again, they won games one and two, walk-off fashion in game one. Uh, kind of that dominant double-digit fashion we saw for a lot of last year, and then kind of you know felt felt or fell a little bit in Game Three, and a part of part of that in Game Three was just nine walks from Rangers pitching, uh, not something we saw a lot of last year. What was your biggest takeaway uh, from the opening weekend? Yeah, just you know, this is a uh, a really good team. You know, I, I try not to. Uh, put too much stock into three games, uh, you know, as much as it's tough to do because you so badly want to have the conversations and uh, it's it's the only data that you have. But, 
you know, I, I think we knew that this was a really good lineup. I think it was fun to watch Wyatt Langford, uh, you know, get his major league toes wet. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's fun to see Corey Seager swinging the bat. And, uh, you know, all the things that I think we we either were expecting or uh, we were we knew we were excited to to get the chance to do uh, on the pitching side. Again, nothing, nothing really crazy. You no, know, nothing that John Gray, Nathan Avaldi, or, or Cody Bradford did was a big surprise. You know, with John Gray, you know that uh, he can have outings like what he had yesterday, and he also can have a month-long stretch of dominance. Uh, the fastball uh, is an inconsistent pitch for him. It was yesterday from a command and results standpoint, and just in general, it didn't seem like he had great stuff. And then with the bullpen, again, I mean, you know, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, walks have long been a problem for Jose Leclerc. He also uh, has these very streaky stretches, and uh, you know he he maybe will have uh, five weeks of just being uh, untouchable, and then two weeks where he's having a tough time throwing strikes. And it looks like to start the year, uh, two outings, five walks. I mean that's a challenge, but uh, it you know it was nice to we we think so much about things through the lens of the stars and the individuals, but uh, you know it was nice to see the bullpen depth. Uh, you know, David Robertson, Kirby H, Josh Spores, Jose Leclerc will be a part of the solution. He has been the last few years, even if it's been a rocky start. And then to see Yeri Rodriguez and Jose Urania, uh, to be honest with you, Ryan, those might be the two biggest takeaways for me this weekend. Uh, because if those two guys can uh, put together strong years, then that's going to really change the complexion of the bullpen. So depth is huge. Uh, it's not always the, the stars who really move the needle uh, over the course of 162 because uh, you know what you're going to get from them. They're going to be special. It's, it's you know, what are you going to get from your depth guys? And I think so far, you know, three games, the Rangers have shown that depth uh, is something that can be a strength of theirs. And that depth kind of trickles down into the minor league system as well. Uh, mm -hmm. You look at guys like Mark Church and Jack Leiter and Owen White, who made his major league debut last year. There's a lot of depth um, in the minor league system as well. Do you see any of those guys being called up at any point this season, at least before September call-ups? A guy like Jack Leiter coming up to maybe get his first start and get a, a spot in this starting rotation potentially, as well as Mark Church, who had a really solid spring. Do you see any of those guys uh, coming up at least at any point during the season? I think those guys and, and several others. Uh, you know, it just the nature of well, the Rangers used almost 50 players last year. So, uh, you're going to see a lot of guys who didn't start the season on the team end up on the active roster making contributions or being in a position to make contributions. Uh, I think Jack Leiter, who got off to a great start with his uh, AAA uh, you know, season debut, uh, he pitched in relief because Michael Lorenzen got a, a rehab start, but five innings, two runs, two hits, nine strikeouts, and the key for me is you're a walk. So you know, Jack Leiter just barely missed making the team. And as long as he stays healthy, I fully expect him to spend more days as a big leaguer this year than not. Uh, and in what role? I think it just depends on where the need is. It could be a multi-inning relief role. It could be as a starting pitcher. Uh, same with Mark Church. I think Mark Church, uh, we know what his role is going to be. It's going to be as a reliever. But I think he uh, has a chance to spend more days at the big league level than in the minors this year. Uh, he does have a little bit of work to do. Uh, but I fully expect to see him up there. And then I think there there's several others. Uh, you know, with Owen White, uh, chances are there will be an opportunity. But, you know, whereas with Mark Church and Jack Leiter, the arrows pointing up, that's not really the case with Owen White. You know, he came up last year, made his debut. And when he got sent down, I think the thought was, hey, we're going to see him again. We'll see him in, in a few months. Uh, and he just didn't pitch in a way that warranted that. And so I think that was probably disappointing for him and the organization. He didn't have a good spring training. Uh, and, and, you know, that all that did was really take him out of the conversation to be on the opening day roster. But, you know, we all know that uh, the spring training results only mean so much. And if he can turn it around with uh, the regular season now upon him in AAA, then, you know, that could easily change the narrative. But he definitely needs to to make a U-turn and change the narrative. Whereas with Jack Leiter and Mark Church, you know, I think what they did uh, in spring training is has sort of put given them a push start and uh, has the arrow pointing up for both those guys. And talking about Jack Leiter as well, another Rangers first-round pick who had a meteoric rise through the minor league system last year. Uh, Wyatt Langford, of course, he had a really great opening series uh, being at the game on Sunday, seeing it, seeing his first ever um, multi-base hit, that uh, two-run triple. That man's got some pop on the bat, and he's just done a phenomenal job. As kind of an unprecedented rise through the minor league system that we've seen, at least as Ranger fans. What do you think 
is the secret behind that, just his quick rise to the minor league system. He's just a very special player. I mean, you got to think, just a year ago, he was playing for Florida, leading them to a 51-win season and a college World Series finals appearance. And it's just a quick rise unlike anything we've ever seen. Uh, just what makes White Langford so special? Yeah, man, I think there, there are a few elements to this. One, there's there's just the, the talent, you know, the ability. There's a reason he was one of the top picks in the country and uh, the reason, you know, he had all the success playing high-level college baseball. I mean, the SEC is, is an incredibly challenging conference, and not only did he do it in the SEC, but as you mentioned, he did it, you know, on the, the biggest stages in college baseball, the regional, super regional, and into the College World Series. And you know, even though Florida didn't win the College World Series, it certainly wasn't because of Wyatt Langford. He had a, an outstanding three games uh, in the final and, and during his time in Omaha. Uh, he's just got incredible talent. Uh, and, you know, some of that's the strength, the power, the, the foundational hitting skills. I think what Rangers fans have gotten to see already through three games is is the plate discipline and the pitch recognition and, you know, the different things that are maybe process related that go into making a, a really good hitter. Uh, and then, you know, I think outside of that, for a guy at his, uh, you know, at, at his age with his level of experience or, or lack thereof, uh, to be able to handle all this, you got to, you know, between the ears, be in a, a, a strong position to do that. You got to mentally uh, know how to handle it, to know how to carry yourself uh, and and why it's very even keel. You know, he's he's I don't want to say he doesn't have a lot of personality because I don't think that's fair to, to suggest. But I think, you know, much like Corey Seager and Marcus Simeon, he shows up, he's there to do his work. Uh, and, you know, he's very focused. He doesn't get too high, doesn't get too low. He understands that. Uh, you know, baseball is a, an interesting sport that's going to come, you know, complete with peaks and valleys. And I don't think that, you know, he uh, took his uh, foot off the pedal of, you know, kind of that narrow, uh, that that tunnel vision mindset of, of, you know, what's ahead and what he's trying to achieve when he found out he made the team. It was just kind of ho-hum, just the same way where when he got off to a really slow start in spring training, knowing that he was, you know, playing for a chance to make the team, it was also kind of like ho-hum. Uh, and I think that, you know, the the talent – and the mental makeup combined really are what help uh, you know create a, a, a guy who's had a special start to his professional career. Absolutely, I agree. And then just going back to that Cubs series, a looking at the starting rotation, I was kind of surprised to see Bochi put Cody Bradford, a guy who is you know uh, expected to maybe be the fourth or fifth guy in the rotation, just starting game two. Uh, do you think? Do you think that they're just still trying to? kind of figure out and shuffle where they want that starting five or did that uh, day off in between kind of play a factor in that? What was the, what was behind the decision uh, to start Cody Bradford in game two? Yeah. I don't think it had anything to do with them saying, Hey, we think Cody Bradford's the second best pitcher. I think, mm -hmm. you know, John, John Gray had neck stiffness and Andrew Heaney had a little bit of side tightness. Mm -hmm. And so they wanted to give them, you know, extra days. Uh, I think they wanted Dane Dunning to start against Tampa Bay. They just liked that matchup. Uh, and so they figured, all right, we'll throw Cody Bradford there in the two spot. You know, I think if you were to power rank the starting rotation by ability, you probably would have John Gray, despite his his first start yesterday not going so well, you'd probably have him slotted behind Nathan Avaldi. But one of the challenges with that is uh, if you go Avaldi and then Gray, now three, four, and five in your rotation are three guys who probably are two-time through the order, 70 to 80 pitch type guys. Uh, and so now that's going to put your bullpen – uh, in a, a more challenging spot to have three straight game, uh, three straight days where uh, they're going to need to cover some length. Uh, whereas if you can break it up a little bit, even though John Gray ironically didn't give you any length yesterday, he's a guy who is able to do so more consistently, or at least he, he was last year. And now you give the bullpen a little bit of a staggered look in, in terms of what your expectations are for your starters. So I think that's saying that Bruce Bochy, uh, has to consider, especially early on now, that dynamic might change when Michael Lorenzen is ready to go. But uh, for now, I think that's you know one thing that played a role. But also, why was it Bradford and not Heaney or Dunning? Uh, I think they liked Dunning facing the the uh, the Rays, and I think with Andrew Heaney because of the side issue, they just wanted to back him up a bit. Yeah, and, and now let's look ahead to that Tampa series. Now, like you mentioned before, they have Dunning, Andrew Heaney, and Nathan Navaldi lined up for that series. Um, is it going to be the first time they've played Tampa since that wild card sweep to start the postseason uh, last October in Tampa? Uh, what are you looking for in that series uh, from both the pitching staff and the offense? 
uh, just especially with that Houston series uh, looming ahead uh, after the Tampa series. Yeah, I you know I'd like to see at some point Jose Leclerc get back on the mound and have a you know a successful outing to get him going in the right direction. You know, I'm curious to see how these relievers continue to uh, continue to perform because obviously that was a huge issue last year. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I just, I wish I could say that I'm excited for a series with a lot of energy inside the trop, but we know that their fan support isn't great. Uh, but it's still a good team. Uh, I don't think their roster is as talented this year as it was last year, but, uh, you know, one thing that you know about Tampa Bay is that, uh, you know, they're going to get the most out of their pitchers. They're going to try and exploit your weaknesses. They do that as well as any team. Uh, they love the elevated fastball. That's a, a big part of what they do. And, you know, that was a, a weakness for the Rangers last year. They weren't necessarily the best at hitting the elevated fastball. And so, you know, they're going to be challenged. But, uh, you know, this is, a like I said, I think the Rangers are a really good team and uh, really good teams face other good teams. And, uh, you know, I don't think that you necessarily go there saying, hey, if we can just come away with one of three, we're happy. If the Rangers win one of three, then that means Tampa did its job because, you know, you go, you, you, you're a good team at home. You're supposed to take two or three. But uh, I think uh, the Rangers, are, at least offensively, it seems like they're in a good place. Uh, and I'm curious to see how they uh, how they perform against some tough Tampa pitching. Now, looking at the uh, AL West uh, division, uh, there are those who kind of think highly of Seattle this year uh, when you consider the uh, the second half they had last last season. And the really the starting rotation they have is very solid with guys like uh, George uh, George Kirby uh, leading that ro- rotation as well. Um, do you see them as potentially a bigger threat to the Rangers' potential ALS title more so than the Astros, or do you see it more as a, of like a three way dogfight for the Western Division title? Well, I, I think both. I think uh, I think it is a three team race. I don't see the the Angels competing for the ALS, and I definitely don't see the A's. Um, if you ask me which team I think poses a bigger threat, I think it's Seattle, and it has nothing to do with the way that. Uh, Houston started the season. It's not like Seattle's gotten off to you know a roaring start either. I just think that uh, you look at their rotation and it is it is incredibly strong and deep and uh, and and very tough. You don't you're not going to face a guy in their starting rotation who uh, you know you 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 look at on paper at least with the way we perceive all of them right now who you look at on paper and say wow we've got a huge advantage here and it's not like their bullpen is, uh, you know, is going to be a cakewalk either. So mm-hmm. um, I, I think Seattle is the better team, uh, you know, if compared against Houston. But I also, if you told me that Houston ended up better than Seattle, I wouldn't say you're crazy. I think that the three teams, the Rangers, the Astros, and the Mariners uh, are going to be jockeying for positioning in the AL West all year long. And maybe one team pulls away. You know, obviously you never know how it's going to play out. But, you know, right now as we sit, uh, one weekend into the season, nothing's happened to change my mind about this being a three-team division. Absolutely. I, I agree as well. And now let's go ahead and get to some of our fan questions uh, from the Texas Rangers fans only Facebook page on Facebook, one of the fastest growing uh, f- Ranger fan communities on the internet. First question is from Brandon Howard. After DeGrom's injury in 2023, the common consensus was that a best case scenario would be an August 2024 return. We're still hearing that today, but is it even reasonable or wise to expect him to be back on the mound before 2025 with all the time he spent away? Yeah, I mean, I I think, listen, because his targeted return date without any sort of setbacks, uh, as you mentioned, would be uh, August. If there is some kind of a setback, which is not uncommon uh, in a, a pitcher's recovery from Tommy John, then you know, maybe the Rangers would just decide, much like the Dodgers did with Walker Beeler, to, to push uh, and wait for 2025. I think you know both sides would love to get him on the mound this year, one, mm-hmm. uh, to allow him to begin that process of knocking off the rust when it comes to uh, pitching in game situations. Uh, because we, all, we, know, we know that with guys coming back from Tommy John, it's sort of a crapshoot early on. You know, they're trying to you know, rediscover, re, re-find that comfort. Uh, but also, here's the the deal. Jacob Degrom's one of the best pitchers, uh, you know, in baseball of all time. He's an alien when it comes to the things he's able to do. And when he's on the mound, usually good things happen. So even if it's for three innings, four innings, five innings, uh, those are three, four, five innings uh, that you know you feel pretty good about the results you're going to get on the mound. So uh, I do think it's realistic to expect him to be back. But I also don't think you're crazy uh, if you were to tell me that the way the story plays out is the Rangers end up pushing until 2025. Uh, He's going to have more than enough time in his recovery to pitch this year. 
uh, you know, August and, and even in early September. I mean, that is, you know, right in line, maybe a little bit uh, can more conservative than your typical Tommy John recovery. Uh, so that it's not like they'd be rushing him. It's just a matter of uh, where he's at and, and not doing anything silly or foolish to uh, compromise the long-term health of a guy who I think the Rangers fully expect to head their rotation in 2025. And then uh, a couple other arms uh, in, for, for the Rangers, uh, Max Scherzer, uh, they, they picked up halfway last year from the Mets. Uh, I've, what, what's his expected uh, return or timetable, as well as uh, Taylor Molly, uh, the relief pitcher that the Rangers picked up as well? What do you think the timetable is for both of those guys? Yeah, well, with Scherzer, you know, the Rangers had a decision to make. They could have placed him on the 60-day IL to begin the season or uh, opt to put him on the 15-day IL. And I think that was going to strictly be based on their expected return for Max Scherzer. They're not going to put him on the 60-day IL uh, if they expect him back within the 60 day window and they didn't put him on the 60 day IL. And so, you know, that bodes well. In addition to what Max has said, he feels like he's on schedule for a, a mid May to late May return. So, you know, I think the, the hope and expectation again, you know, without any setbacks along the way is that Max Scherzer is, uh, is back at that point. Max is kind of at the very, very, very beginning of spring training mode in terms of where he is. He's healthy. He's now got to ramp up. You know, he's, he's uh, you basically think like last week was when pitchers and catchers reported for Max Scherzer. Uh, and so, you know, he's probably, uh, you know, about that six, seven week mark from returning. Uh, he'll go and, and pitch, a, you know, a few games in the minor leagues on a rehab assignment. And then, uh, you know, hopefully he comes back healthy, ready to go. Like I said, mid to late May with uh, Tyler Malley. Uh, he's probably more of a July guy. He's a tiny bit ahead of uh, schedule from Jacob DeGrom, but you know, whereas Max Scherzer's got a back injury, both Malley and DeGrom or Tommy John. So it's a similar thing that, you know, I, I share with Malley that I shared with DeGrom. You know, you, you just there's still so much of a runway for them between where they are now and, and actually taking off and, and being back. Uh, things can happen. Setbacks can happen. Guys coming back from Tommy John, you know, they push themselves so much that sometimes they have to just press pause for a week or two just to give their arm a reset. Right. And it's not. You know, I'm not going to sit here and say that it shouldn't be a cause for concern. Anything that's arm related, that's not moving, you know, full steam ahead could be a cause for concern. But uh, it is very normal for a Tommy John recovery to include some sort of a pause or a delay or a setback and isn't an indication that things are not going smoothly. Sometimes they go full, you know, perfectly smoothly, uh, but you just have to be prepared. So when you you give that timeline of July uh, for Tyler Malley, that's that's what it looks like right now. But you know, there are still a number of hurdles he's got to clear in order to, to be back in July. And then uh, another another guy that I'm, most Ranger fans probably think really highly of, um, a regular on your Straight Up Texas podcast, Nathaniel Lowe. He's out with an injury as well. Uh, when can we expect the Rangers' first baseman uh, to come back to the uh, on the field as well? Yeah, I think mid to late April is is the plan. Um, you know, with obliques, uh, the last thing you want to do is come back prematurely. We've seen so many cases, you know, more so six, seven, eight years ago when oblique injuries really started to become a lot more prevalent, guys coming back early and either not performing well or re-injuring uh, themselves. And I think because of where we are in the season, there's no reason for Nathaniel Lowe to try and be a hero like maybe a player would in, in September in a pennant race or a divisional race. You know, I think, hey, take take the time you need. Uh, and the Rangers, you know, have Jared Walsh and he's, you know, got off to a good start this weekend. Uh, we'll obviously wait to see how things go over, you know, an extended period of time. But I think the Rangers feel good about their depth at first base and uh, that that allows them to you know, put Nathaniel Lowe on a proper timetable. And uh, hopefully he's getting some big league at bats uh, before the calendar turns to May. Absolutely. And then uh, one more fan question. This one's from Christy, Christy McLaughlin. Um uh, how many times will World Series champs be mentioned or referenced uh, in radio broadcasts this year? And how fun has it been able uh, to say that? I know the season has started and you kind of got to start looking ahead and st come down on cloud nine. But how fun has that been for uh, you, Eric and Matt? Yeah, I mean, it's been incredible. It's been it's been such a dream. And it's a dream that you know was made possible by the players, the coaches, the support staff and the baseball operations team in the front office. And uh, we're incredibly thankful for. Uh, all of their hard work to allow us to have this, you know, amazing experience. And I, I think, I mean, listen, the Rangers are the defending world champions for another 159 games. And uh, and then maybe, you know, they'll be able to run it back and uh, it will be for uh, the next uh, year plus where we can say this. But uh, I mean, it, as long as the statement is still accurate, I don't I don't see us uh, not mentioning that. Uh, but obviously, you know, there is, uh, 
you know, there, there's a really good ball club in 2024 wearing Rangers uniforms. And uh, I know their attention is, is in trying to do what they didn't do last year, which is first and foremost, win the division. Uh, and then try and do what they did last year, which is win another World Series and what has not been done in uh, in over two decades. And that's a team repeating uh, as World Series champions. So, uh, I, you know, I, I think the players probably are trying to turn their attention to 2024. But from our standpoint, uh, you know, I, I think we'll we'll make sure to take full advantage of the opportunity to mention last year's World Series championship. He's Jared Sandler. Again, you can find him on the Straight Up Texas podcast on Valley Sports Southwest as well. And I'm not just saying this because you're here, but I genuinely think the Rangers Radio Network has the best radio crew in baseball. But outside of all that broadcasting, you also have the Sandlot Children's Charity. Can you tell us about that as well? Yeah, it's a, it's an organization that helps support kids with physical and intellectual is, uh, disabilities by providing financial assistance to organizations that create opportunities for them to get involved uh, in athletics and active programming. The ability to be active and to participate in athletics uh, is something that, uh, you know, has had such a big impact on so many people. And unfortunately for uh, kids with disabilities, it's sometimes a little more cost prohibitive uh, for organizations who want to, you know, create the programming and, and provide these opportunities. It's also cost prohibitive sometimes for them to uh, sustain or to grow. And so we want to try and break down those barriers. And uh, we've had tremendous support from the community uh, the website is the sandlot.org. Uh, you can you know find out all the information you need on there, including our upcoming event in 2024, which will be back at Globe Life Field on the actual field. Uh, you'll be able to uh, run around and play all sorts of games. Uh, we'll have more information on that uh, over the course of the spring and summer, but uh, you can make donations there. You can learn more about our ambassador program, which is ability, which is an ability to uh, connect with the charity, meet people, and also get out in the community and volunteer. Uh, so all sorts of stuff, but the website's the sandlot.org. And I uh, appreciate you asking about it, Ryan. And I appreciate people who take uh, take a few minutes to check it out. Yeah, absolutely. Again, the website is the sandlot.org. It's a great, great cause. Go out there and support it if you can. And just read about it. They have a mission statement video posted on the website as well. That's the sandlot.org for the San, uh, Sandlot uh, Children's Charity. And also, again, want to thank you again, Jared, for joining us today. You can find him on the Straight Up Texas podcast on Bally Sports Southwest and on the Texas Rangers Radio Network. And you can find him on Twitter slash X at Jared Sandler. Jared, once again, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate you. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Here at L4 Media, we talk high school football, 4A, 3A, and 2A in Texas. We talk East Texas sports. We talk NFL, guy talk, movie, and booze. We also talk wrestling and so much more. So like and subscribe and check us out. And welcome back to the Texas Two Scene Podcast. I want to give a quick shout out again to Jared Sandler for joining us on the show jared sandler again uh, you can find him on the straight up texas podcast uh, regular on 105.3 the fan up in dallas also a, a, an occasional uh, broadcaster on television at bally sports southwest the official home of the texas rangers as well as on the texas rangers radio network uh, alongside matt hicks and longtime voice of the rangers eric nadell again a huge shout out to jared and support support his work man um uh, the Sandlot Children's Charity. Again, that's the sandlot.org. Uh, just contribute uh, if you can, or just uh, research them, man. Just see what they do. They do a lot of great work over over there at the Sandlot Children's Charity. Jared, very heavily involved in that, very passionate uh, about uh, bringing opportunities uh, to you know disabled youth uh, to participate in sports and empower them through the power of sports. So, again, great work they're doing there at the Sandlot Children's Charity. Again, that's the Sandlot dot org the sandlot dot org uh, again huge shout out to jared really appreciate it and appreciate you guys for tuning in to the very first episode of the texas two scene podcast again we'll be here uh, every monday to discuss the fallout of the previous uh, week in major league baseball especially with the defending world series champion texas rangers and we'll look ahead to the upcoming weeks as well we'll be here every monday through the entire season all the way through the playoffs all the way through the finale of the 2024 world series right here on outdrink the coverage on l4 media i give a shout again to jared sandler thanks to uh, terry and brett over at l4 media 
for giving me this opportunity. I'm really happy to be here, really happy to talk about the Texas Rangers and Major League Baseball. And we'll see you next Monday on a weekly basis right here on the Texas Two Scene Podcast. And again, one more shout as well to our sponsor, Car Motor Company in downtown Cleburne. Car Motor Company, again, you can find them at 302 South Caddo in historic downtown Cleburne. You can give them a call at 817-666-1111, and you can keep up with their ever-changing inventory of classic and late model cars and trucks, convertible convertibles, and SUVs at www.txcar.com. That's www.txcar.com. Again, one more shout out to everyone for tuning in to the first ever episode of the Texas Two Scene Podcast. 